how he learned to mix accurate details with forged ones, that for disinformation to be successful it must at least partially respond to reality, or at least accepted views. He explained how leaking stolen documents had been a standard procedure in disinformation activities for more than half a century. He estimated that individual disinformation operations during the Cold War numbered more than 10,000, and he brought the examples to life with stories of a make-believe German neo-fascist group with an oak-leaf logo, of forged Nazi documents hidden in a forest lake in Bohemia, of U.S. nuclear war plans leaked again and again all over Europe, of a Soviet master forger flustered in a strip club in Prague. This careful and thoughtful old man taught me more about the subject of my forthcoming testimony than any technical intelligence report I had read or any digital forensic connections I could make. He made it real. In early 2016, I was in the middle of an extensive two-year technical investigation into Moonlight Maze, the first known state-on-state -state digital espionage campaign in history, a prolific, high-end Russian spying spree that began in the mid-1990s and never stopped. With luck and persistence, I was able to track down one of the actual servers used by Russian operators in 1998 to engineer a sprawling breach of hundreds of U.S. military and government networks. A retired systems administrator had kept the server, an old clunky machine, under his desk at his home outside London, complete with original log files and Russian hacking tools. It was like finding a time machine. The digital artifacts from London told the story of a vast hacking campaign that could even be forensically linked to recent espionage activity. Our investigation showed the persistence and skill that large spy agencies bring to the table when they hack computer networks. Those big spy agencies that had invested in expensive technical signals intelligence collection during the Cold War seemed to be especially good at hacking, and good at watching others hack. Then, on June 14th, news of the Democratic National Committee computer network break-in hit. Among the small community of people who research high-end computer network breaches, there was little doubt from that day forward that we were looking at another Russian intelligence operation. The digital artifacts supported no other conclusion. The following day, the leaking started, and the lying. A hastily created online account suddenly popped up, claiming that a lone hacker had stolen files from Democrats in Washington. The account published a few pilfered files as proof, indeed offering evidence that the leak was real, but not that the leaker was who they claimed. It was clear then, on June 16th, that some of the world's most experienced and aggressive intelligence operators were escalating a covert attack on the United States. Over the next days and weeks, I watched the election interference as it unfolded carefully collecting some of the digital breadcrumbs that Russian operators were leaving behind. In early July, I decided to write up a first draft of this remarkable story. I published two investigative pieces on the ongoing disinformation campaign, the first in late July 2016, on the day of the Democratic Convention, and the second three weeks before the general election. But I noticed that I was not adequately prepared for the task. I had a good grasp of digital espionage and its history, but not of disinformation, what intelligence professionals used to call active measures. We live in an age of disinformation. Private correspondence gets stolen and leaked to the press for malicious effect. Political passions are inflamed online in order to drive wedges into existing cracks in liberal democracies. Perpetrators sow doubt and deny malicious activity in public, while covertly ramping it up behind the scenes. This modern era of disinformation began in the early 1920s, and the art and science of what the CIA once called political warfare grew and changed in four big waves, each a generation apart. As the theory and practice of disinformation evolved, so did the terms that described what was going on. The first wave of disinformation started forming in the interwar years, during the Great Depression, in an era of journalism transformed by the radio, newly cutthroat and fast-paced. Influence operations in the 1920s and early 1930s were innovative.